Jacqueline Wall. I'm the director of marketing with the festival. And um, welcome to In Their Shoes with David Crane and Jeffrey Cleric, hosted by Ophir Eisenberg, and presented, yes, 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 um, and presented by Celia Joyce Johnson. Um, I would like to take this moment to thank our major sponsors, Showtime and The White Elephant, and then also all the wonderful volunteers, venue staff, projectionists, and everyone that makes this festival possible. Um, <laughs> also, um, I just want to announce that we have announced uh, two of our screenings for Best of Fest. Um, they are the 1215 screening it will be on Monday, Bombshell, the Hedy Lamar story, and then the 1245 screening will be the big sick. Uh, tickets are on sale and available at the box office and online. Um, now that I'm done with all the housekeeping stuff, I just want to say um, that I, I just want to gush a little bit about our host and our guests. Uh, David Crane and Jeffrey Cleric have written the lines that are in my head and that I say out loud um, and they are ingrained in me. Truly, um, when it was said who was going to introduce, there was no choice. It was going to be me. Nobody else. Like all the staff backed away. Um, so uh, they just mean so much to me. Um, and then also our host is the fantastically funny Ophira Eisenberg. Um, she is the seasoned host of Late Night Storytelling, now Late Night Letters, um, and, which is tonight, and is one of my favorite programs that we do here. Um, so please welcome, join me in welcoming Ophira, Jeffrey, and David. That is so nice. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I, I already can tell this, you're my people. You hate sun and you love television, and that's why you're here. Put my little feet on this ledge. Uh, I am thrilled and honored to be sitting here with David Crane and Jeffrey Cleric to talk to them about their extraordinary careers and life. Um, I will say that when I was asked to um, moderate and host this event, immediately on Twitter, Jeffrey followed me. I just got on Twitter. I just got on Twitter. For yeah. The uh, and I was like, oh my God, I have to say something funny. I went through all of my tweets and I was like, political, weird, um, a retweet of something dark, weird. Uh, but I, in that moment, I decided we have a relationship and I'm your Canadian girlfriend. Because um, I'm Canadian, so it works out. It works out. If I'm just going to run through a little bit of your credits by way of a formal introduction. Um, David Crane is best known as the co-creator of Friends, for which he won numerous awards, including an Emmy for Outstanding Comedy Series. He co-created Veronica's Closet, The Powers That Be, and the much-beloved HBO series Dream On, for which he received an Emmy nomination for Outstanding Writing for a Comedy Series. Jeffy Cleric co-created The Class, he co-produced Mad About You, which earned him a Golden Globe, as well as an Emmy nomination. He also created Half and Half, and has written and produced the comedies Inc., The Naked Truth, and Dream On. Together, they are the co-creators of Showtime's series Episodes, starring <laughs> Matt LeBlanc. It is about to launch its fifth and final season. We'll be talking about ways to undo that. Um, <laughs> But first, um, so yes, of course, Jeffrey Cleric, David Crane. And you know, I did, I did do diligence before sitting with you uh, and read articles uh, and, and went through a lot of your past work. But I will tell you, as two people that work together so well and are also partners for 28 years. Yeah. Yep. I have to ask you, because in, a, in any collaborative process, I've asked people before, how did you meet? But this is sort of specific, because you're also in the same house, in the same world together. How did you two meet? I, I was a mail order bride. <laughs> <laughs> and I just lucked out. <laughs> I thought you were gonna ask about my shoes. I thought this thing was about oh, shoes. Oh yeah, that, then we get into your shoes. <laughs> <I got> it. <laughs> yeah. Now? 
So t how do we meet? Uh, how do we meet? We were uh, we were set up on a date uh, in New York. We both lived in New York at the time, and he knew, and I didn't know it was a setup. And so uh, walked in, and I saw the table was set for four, and I was like, "Oh, interesting." Um, and so and he uh, said it like that, so I, I knew he was gay right away. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it worked. It could have gone south so really fast. This is going to go well. Yeah. And uh, funnily enough, funnily, is that funnily? a word? Yeah. Uh, I don't like this. That's okay. <laughs> Can you hear me without it? No, no. All right. <laughs> Hold it up. Anyway, um, I put on your shoes that night. That's weird. You're right. There is a shoes theme. I was in his shoes the yeah. first night. Yeah, you did. You were like, oh, those are nice shoes. Can I try on your shoes? Which was a weird and interesting yeah. kind of flirtation. And I was like, <laughs> okay. Because well, I thought... If he's the right size, maybe this could work out. <laughs> <laughs> right, if you could and only buy that's one how we pair of shoes. Yeah, the shoes did fit. Were yeah, you both shoes. writers at the time? Was this a... I wasn't working, and he was a writer. Y yeah, I was, uh, I was sort of transitioning from being a theater writer. I'd been living in New York doing theater for about 10 years and uh, had started doing, going back and forth to L.A., trying to sell scripts and hadn't had anything produced yet and uh, was sort of at that cusp of uh, hadn't really, really, I mean, television was theoretical at that point. And, and he had no money and I had money. So. <laughs> <laughs> what were you doing at the time? I wasn't working. Not working, but you had but, money. That's... Oh, I had been in advertising for a long oh, time. Yes. So I, I put away all my money and I had money, which is... Yeah. <laughs> nice. Uh, and so, yeah, so I wasn't interested in him for his money. <laughs> <laughs> but my shoes. <laughs> but shoe. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, last night, some of you may know, there was a tribute, and uh, David and Jeffrey were awarded an award for an outstanding, um, outstanding uh, contribution to creative writing on television. In their acceptance speech, they both said that every morning they wake up and wonder, amused, do I have the ability to do this again? Will it work? S people that are so accomplished, it makes you sound very human uh, and very humble, but my question... That's why we said it. <laughs> <laughs> but my question is, uh, what is it going to take? D d that will never change. I don't think that, I think that's just baked in. Uh, we just, really, we, uh, starting every, it's, I was about to say new project, but even new scene, like we'll start a scene and go, oh, I hate the scene, I don't know what the scene's about, where are we going, what are we doing, can we do this, should we even do this? <laughs> but, it's it, but it's spiral. like that, I mean, if we have to send a card to somebody, <laughs> I'm not kidding, we agonize over writing like a birthday card message. You know, when they pass around the card at the office and everybody's supposed to sign, it's like, can I have a few minutes? I really, because it's just, it's, and added pressure because they're like, it's going to be a brilliant thing, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or, or even an email. An email. Yeah, it's it's just an email. And, and I'm like passing the commuter and him going, eh, should, is it, should it should be funnier? I don't know. Does it need to be funnier? So yes, I don't know. It, I don't think it ever ends. I think it's just that's... But us. I don't think every writer is like that. I, don't, I can't imagine, you know, David E. Kelly or somebody like that who's just like grinds it out. I don't think everybody has that kind of panic. I don't know. That we that have, which is of kind of sad. Yeah, I mean, I relate to it, but I've also achieved just a little less than you. <laughs> um, but so I just, you know, I do wonder, and I think a lot of people that work in an artistic endeavor wonder if there is ever that moment, like that panic of like, I hope it works out, blah, blah, blah. If there ever is that moment where you just go, no. I know what I'm doing. No. No, no, no. I mean, I think you have... M brief momentary flashes within whatever you're working on where something in it, you have no control over it. We talk about it sort of like, the, you know, these sort of writer gods give you a moment where you're like, oh, this seems funny. This is working. <laughs> and, and you almost don't feel responsible for it working. It's just somehow you've channeled something. That's exactly right. Yeah. And, I, and you can't help but think if I were a plumber, for example, or any other any other job, after 30 years of doing it, you kind of would think... I know what to do. 
And, and you don't. Every single day is just like hellish. And <laughs> <laughs> it really is. It really is. And I, I think also the... And I avoid no, no, him like the plague. I'll stay in the room and watch The View. I'll do everything in my power not to come out so we have to work. Because he knows I'll be the one going, um, we kind of need to work on this yeah. today. Uh, yeah. Um, and I, I think actually as time goes on, the more you do know, because obviously we... We have been doing it a long time, and you do. But I think a lot of that perspective is also works against you. Because I think when we started out, we like could write something and go, oh, this is pretty good. And now we know enough yeah, we know. that we'll look at it and go, I know eight ways this is terrible. And I, know, I really understand why this could not work. And, and so I think all of that sort of experience can sort of work against you. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's. I would like to cue a montage that is celebrating really? your work as a just an example of some of that. the hellish stuff that you have managed <laughs> to create. Okay. Are we okay to do that? Did I? Ah, perfect. Did someone call for the long arm of the law? magic trick, you know, and no one even knows until it's too late, then suddenly you see him on a talk show and it's like, holy shit, that guy's English? 
They're on our TV shows. They're in our movies. They, they, there should be congressional hearings or something. Fucking British people. Stay the fuck home. No offense. <laughs> That's what I love about this business. When push comes to shove, you put all the crap aside and make great TV. I don't have to like you. You don't have to like me. Not to worry. Exactly. <laughs> we are professionals. Yep. <laughs> like two old whores. <laughs> <laughs> right? Who won't we fuck? <laughs> uh, I'm excited about this. I yeah, know you are. <laughs> I Amazing. wish we could sit in the audience <laughs> <laughs> and enjoy it. Yeah, well, it's it's because it's so enjoyable. Is oh, it yeah. not enjoyable? <laughs> so you know, as we are watching that montage, obviously every single one of us uh, here definitely attached to you know so many moments. I mean, God, I watched Mad About you. The crazy thing about Mad About You that was what mid nineties, yeah. right? 90, 92. 90, 92? Yeah. Uh, you show those clips there, and people right now, 2017, are still laughing at the toilet roll, <laughs> right? I mean, it was realism, and I guess that realism, uh, even though you may have thought, oh, that is something that existed, you know, we've, n we've not moved beyond that. We haven't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I know Friends is having like this revival in terms of reaching a younger generation. I mean, when I watched it, our, my friends and I were like, are you a Rachel or a Monica or a Phoebe, right? If you were the girls and the, and the boys would pick their archetype. Because we were relating it realism one-to-one, -one, even though maybe we didn't live in New York and we didn't have those fabulous apartments. But now I know um, friends in their 20s are watching it and they love it. They love the humor but they're not relating to it one-on-one. -on -one. They're watching it in a different way. They're watching it, um, I think, like a time capsule or something like that. The humor still resonates. I, I, th I think it's... Um, I, I, because we're also finding out that there are, like, kids who are, like, 11 and 12 who are watching it, and, and I think it is still sort of aspirational. It's still looking at it and going, I hope I have... I mean, because I don't think it's so much the... The time, except for like the giant telephones, the yeah, stuff. Yeah, sure. I think it's just wanting that, like someday you hope that you like go and have that group of friends and it's fun and you just get to hang out and that's what your life will be. Um, so I think that's it's it's sort of still, universal. Because to me, I, I feel like for, as far as comedy writing is concerned, you know, episodes is the piece of work right now that is hyper-reality. Not many of us are watching that show and seeing ourselves, but we love watching these people in a hyper reality state and, and we root for them uh, and want them to go down. But it's a different kind of comedy. Is that, did you envision this? Uh, so yeah, see, and I think it's about people that we can all identify with and it has nothing to do with television. I mean, it's, it's a couple, really. It's really about the dynamics of a couple, and one, one of them is like him. Uh, <laughs> David is very positive and, and says, what, the glass is half full? Yeah, uh, yeah, we always said, I always say that the glass is half full. And I said the glass is an idiot. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and so, so I, and that we, that's our dynamic, and people, when they meet us, like him, and I'm like the toughie, you know, I'm like the, eh. and, so, and And that's what Sean and Beverly are. You know, and so we just write us. We really do. Yeah. And so that the, the the TV stuff, I agree, is less. And that's all stuff that that we dealt with with networks and stuff, putting us through all that garbage and and having having to sacrifice and compromise and stuff. I mean that that's what network television is. So I mean we really just wrote about our experience on the class, actually. That was exactly what happened to us on the class. So your move from network television to working with... Now, episodes, you first... You had devised this and then went to the BBC, is that correct? Yeah, what happened was after we did the class and for CBS, we were really disheartened and frustrated and angry. And, and I said, I don't want to do this anymore. It's not worth it. I have shoes. I don't need, <laughs> I don't need anything else. You know, let's just wait to die. And 
I did. I, I thought, how much? He did. How long he could really it be? Really did. <laughs> And to be clear, what was frustrating was dealing with the feedback, the notes. It, it, yeah, the... Basically, it was right after Friends, and they were expecting another Friends. And we said, this is not another Friends. There, there was only one Friends. It's not going to happen. And we wanted to do something different. We wanted to do a, a, a show not about six Friends, but eight people who knew each other from way, way back in third grade, who kind of come back into each other's lives. And, and they all, they yesed us until they bought it. And then once they bought it, it was like, really? Do you need this many people? And what if they know each other at the beginning? And, what, and, and so bit by bit, they start chipping away. And uh, first thing that happened was they put us on Monday nights at 8 o'clock because they thought we would open the night. And we kept saying, that's a big mistake. Nobody knows the show. You can't ex put all that pressure on this and they said no no it's gonna you know it's from the creators and and we did okay I mean the numbers we got then we would be bigger than Big Bang now I mean but but that was 10 years ago yeah and so um, what's the point of my story um, how uh, episodes yeah about. so we came on and it, the, the ratings were fine but they weren't like friends numbers which they expected and so right away they cut our fee like they said uh, they, even though they agreed to a certain amount of money, as soon as it started like just being an okay show, they cut the money. And then we had to fire some writers, and then we had to fire some actors. And it was just like this kind of chiseling away at us, and just it was just so disheartening and so frustrating. And I just thought, I don't want to do this anymore. And my fantasy was I, I'd finally get to do television, I would be happy. And we were the opposite of happy. So I, I said, no, I don't want to do this anymore. And David said, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, I understand let's just wait to die as a plan, but maybe it's not the best plan. <laughs> uh, maybe we could find something that's a little more constructive. Well, you were right. It turns out he was right. <laughs> but but it, it, so, so he was getting nudgy, and he was, you could tell he was unhappy. And so I said, we had a friend who had just come back from England and done a show for the BBC, and he said, they never bother you. You never see them. You just, they give you the money and you go off. And I thought, Jesus, that's what I want. So I thought, okay, I gotta come up with an idea where we can sell it to the BBC and shoot it in America. Wait a second, you're telling me your creative inspiration for this series started with how do we yes. get the BBC involved? How do we get the BBC involved oh, yeah. and no network television? No yeah, it was okay. American Here's network. our plan. And also, they tend to do short orders, like six episodes, yeah. seven episodes. So we could write it all ourselves. Yeah. And we didn't have to have, you know, the standard writer's room and stuff. And we thought, this will be fine. So we went to England, and we went to the BBC, and we, we pitched our little show, and they liked it. They said, fine, and here's the money. And the money was you couldn't buy a pair of shoes. I mean, it's like, it's a different world there. I mean, yes, you have freedom, but you have no money. So, you know, you, you don't have money for sets, so you have to go on location and try to adapt the location so that it looks like LA. And I mean, so we, so suddenly we're doing a show about a British couple who comes to America and we have to shoot it in London. Yeah, because it costs so much more to shoot it in LA. And so we, we, at that point, got Showtime involved, and so it became a co-production, so we got the Showtime money, and, but it was still, the budget wasn't enough to make it in LA, where it takes place, so we ended up shooting the entire show in London, and if you've seen the show, we do about four days in LA to get some exteriors, and everything else is shot in London. Uh, which is crazy because it takes place in LA. And, uh, and the whole plan was, how do we do a show? Yeah in LA. Right, right, for because London. it's LA no, it's, always it's, super sunny. It's, it's meta irony, it just, keep, yeah. And it rains every single day. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and you have, you have the cast, I mean, Kathleen Rose Perkins, who plays Carol. Yay. Hello, okay. Yay! <laughs> it's tricky, isn't it? It's a big vacation for me. But we, we did a, a couple of scenes that take place in her house, and, and it was pouring. You remember that day? Pouring rain. And they have these big lights outside the windows, and they put like palm tree, like fronds, <laughs> in, so that there's, there's like the, the look of like 
movement of trees. It's like, it's like, it's, it's so mom and pop, you know, like let's put on a play in the barn. It's so, it's all that. And it's actually, it's a challenge, but it makes it kind of fun and, and, and interesting to how to, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's very different from what our experience had been doing network TV, where they, they throw a lot of money and a lot of notes at you. And this was total creative freedom. Um, we, 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 as Jeffrey said, we write the episodes ourselves, and then we go to London and we shoot them because there isn't the money to shoot it the way you would normally shoot a show, where you shoot an episode and then another episode. We shoot the whole thing like a, like a four or five hour movie. We shoot the entire season at once. We have a table read, we read five hours, we read the entire season, and then we shoot out each set. So in any given day, we're doing scenes from, like so if you, we're in Carol's Kitchen. You do every scene that takes place in Carol's Kitchen for the entire season. So, yeah. so, so from Kathleen an, is like running and changing outfits yeah. and trying to remember where she was supposed to be. At, I mean, it's really, I don't know how you guys do it. <laughs> but Jeffrey, you directed yes. this final season, so you are dealing with that now. Now, oh, it must be from a control point of view, fantastic. Yeah. Right now, you're, you're, you're writing. Yes. Now you're directing. You're controlling everything. I take her shopping for wardrobe. But that's the other thing. There's, there's no wardrobe, <laughs> so we go to the, the department store and we buy clothes. I mean, it's really it's it's so not what you think television's going to be when you start out. But fun. Ish. Well, ish. No, yeah, ish. But but still, in a way, all of that. It's not like waiting to die. But <laughs> but it's it's okay. Not quite that fun. <laughs> so many times during uh, the process of making episodes, which is great. I mean, you talk about all these challenges, and I don't think, as a viewer, I think about this at all. I don't think about the fact you that will. Kathleen has to think about the next scene being from the finale, even though she. Yeah. I mean, just in terms of. How you're supposed to react to things, knowing I can't even imagine. I what can't a challenge imagine. That is. I don't know how they do it. I don't understand that. It's great writing. Oh, that's uh, why <laughs> it's the great writing. But it, it's it's also yeah. It, it requires a lot of planning, and I mean, and Jeffrey's being modest in terms of, but directing. I mean, you have a such a clear vision of I, yeah. I'm more organizational. He's very organized. Uh, I'm I'm like that sort of OCD, I like everything. But you have such a clear vision in your head of what everything's supposed to look like. So we can talk about a scene in episode seven and uh, you can... Yeah, when we write it, I kind of see it in my head. You know, it's like you see the movie and then we quickly write it. It's, it's very weird. I feel like, I feel like people... I, I shouldn't be called a writer, I'm more of a channeler. <laughs> You know what I mean? I just, I, because I don't feel like it's, I don't know how I do it. I really don't. And th sometimes they'll ask us questions about writing, and I'm thinking, I don't know. It just happens. But right, I, just... I, I think that's when it's at its best. Yeah. I think actually when it's, when it's at its best, you are channeling. You're just, you've, you've gotten rid of that part of your brain that's kind of uh, judging and questioning and analyzing, and, and you're just, yeah, whatever that freedom thing is, uh, I think that's actually when we're doing our best work. Yeah. When you uh, first devised this idea and you were like, okay, we need to get Matt LeBlanc involved as the lead, and you're going to him saying, you're playing yourself. You're the punchline. You're the, but, right, and you, we're yeah. making fun of you. You have to be able to make fun of yourself. It's like, uh, and it's going to be over the top, and, and you have to be willing to satirize yourself. Were you worried that he would be, I don't know, Offended? Uh, no, that he basically said, "I don't mind being the brunt of the joke if the joke is funny." Which right. is, he's pretty yeah. smart. Did and it. I think also coming uh, uh, after Joey, I think he was so burned from that experience that he liked the idea of having the security of working with two people that he kind of knew and trusted, and so. Yeah, and I, I also, we, we took basically the way it happened. We had the idea, and first, Jeffrey, the idea of the, the two British writers who come to America and America destroys their show and their marriage. And then 
subsequently, we had the idea of, all right, how does that happen? Specifically, it happens because the network forces them to cast the absolute wrong actor in their show. And that's when we came up with the idea that it's Matt. And so at that point, we took him to lunch. And we just said, OK, here's the show we want to do. And we both knew if he, at that lunch, said no, we would toss out the whole idea and just come up with something else because yeah. it was so it was a perfect perfect fit yeah. and and the british version does that you guys know what we're talking about you if you've seen hopefully the, you've seen show. the show the british version was derek jacobi for example or uh, richard uh, griffiths or some very dignified you know british guy and so to have suddenly matt leblanc playing mm -hmm. the, the head of a a british boys school and then bit by bit they said, no, we think it'll probably work better if it, he was like a hockey coach. And, and, and so bit by bit they started to, you know, like our experience with the class, until it was, the show was called Pox. Pucks. <laughs> you know, and he was a... a yeah, a, a high school hockey coach. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and then the other element was, and this is, I think, part of what we were able to say to him, Yes, there's the TV satire side of it, but also the show's really about those, the relationships between the characters and the sort of the human part of it, because if it were just a TV satire, I think we would have been bored with it and... Because you have to care about the characters. Yeah, and so it was the idea of, that Matt also is key in destroying their marriage. And, I th and, and so he just wanted to know, he said, so it's me, but it's not me, right? And, we were, and so we were able to sell him on the idea of, no, no, this is absolutely a character we're writing. Yes. Uh, that, it's, uh, that it's just, it's a character we're coming up with. He's called Matt LeBlanc, but... <laughs> <laughs> and he's much thinner than you are. <laughs> Did you ever propose a storyline uh, that w may have pushed the line a little too far for his taste? No, you couldn't do that. No, he didn't have no. that. No. And so he'd come to us with stuff, and I'd think, we can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> people, you, people are going to hate you. But he's, he's oh, yeah. yeah. He's he, game. He was really game. Yeah, yeah, oh, no, yeah. He would pitch stuff. <laughs> no, it's like, like no, we're protecting no, the character. No, 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 no. You can do what you want, but we're protecting the character. Now, I've heard you said that, you know, some of the network execs and Hollywood types that you're skewering it are, you know, people often go, oh, I, I believe I know who that is. And you, you never reveal if it's actually that person or a combination of. But I think people in the business are, uh, pretty much know who these people, I mean, the, I don't know, again, I don't know, but there's a character, Merck, who's the head of the, the network, who's a hugger. He hugs every, well, we worked with somebody like, oh, this is being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> so he's totally fictional. Totally he's fictional. totally fictional. Right. No one's based on anyone. No. No, no. I forget I said any of that stuff. I, but the, um, the head of programming for Showtime, you know, has had some statement about, you know, unfortunately the coming to an end and that just because of the writing of the show, he has had to be held to higher standards. Have you had, like, lunches and cocktails and whatever with... Um, at Hollywood execs that are like, now you could use this in your show, yeah. or yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, or don't put this in your show. Y yeah, or or something will happen and they'll go, this is going to be in the show, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> like it may be, it yeah. just may be. Yeah, and we we made the decision to end it this season. We Showtime wanted more, and we thought, you know what, leave people wanting more. Let's put a bow on it, uh, and and go out when we're ready, not but when people want us to leave. Um, but what made you decide it was time? It, I think basically it's just really hard. I mean, you have to go to, not, it sounds like, oh, it's terrible, you have to go to England for six <laughs> months, but it is. I mean, you're not living at home, you're living you know, out of a suitcase, you're waking up at 5 a.m. every morning, you're getting home at nine o'clock at night. You know, it, it, it's, it's hard, it really is hard. And we saw n very little of England the entire time. Kathleen, on the other hand, <laughs> she would take every weekend, she'd jet off someplace. You know, the actors had it great. And we would spend the weekends, well, we, first of all, we worked six days a week. And, and so we, we were off on Sundays, and Sundays we would rewrite. So that, I mean, it's really... And I think that's the downside of, 
Creatively, it's really satisfying for us to do it all ourselves, and certainly the control side of things is very satisfied because you don't have other writers, it, it, it's just us. Uh, but the downside is it becomes consuming and exhausting and, and... And you can't depend on anybody else to like fix a joke or make something better or you know, work better. You know, it's all on you and it, that's a lot of pressure. Yeah, so right, there's no writer's room. You were the writer's That's room. That's it. Yeah, yeah our kitchen uh, is the writer's room. And, and then do you have, you know, just because obviously you're also in a relationship, do you have like, all right, October through November, we don't talk about work? No. There's, ooh, that, <laughs> it, it gets to the point where... <laughs> seriously. Where I'll just say to him, I'll say, I'm begging you, please, can we just talk about anything else? Do we have to, I mean... Let's just anything. And they'll say, fine, fine, let's talk about something else. And then we sit in silence. <laughs> and uh, he'll say, You want to turn on Howard Stern? You want, is there something you want to. Uh, and, and then they'll, after a little bit, he, every time, he's the one out of the pause, he'll go, Okay, I know I said I want to talk about it, but what if <laughs> Beverly. Because otherwise it's just dead silence. And then what happens is. <laughs> Seriously, and if we ever go anywhere, like on a, to, out for dinner, we sit with a pad at the table. And, and I worry if we, now that the show is done, unless we come up with another show, we're f screwed. <laughs> this is taking a turn that I wasn't expecting. Uh, so it turns out also we're not the same shoe size. Not quite the same shoe size, no, so, but it's similar. Yeah, the joke's yeah. on me. There's a lot, <laughs> lot of things to be worked out. Yeah. Yeah. So now that you've worked uh, you know, in this, uh, for the uh, cable and you're doing wardrobe and writers, do you go, you know what, let's go back to network television. Ugh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> No, and David said, you're burning bridges. You realize you're burning all of these bridges, and my feeling is, I don't want to go back over the bridge again. I don't want to be there, so fine. If I never do it again, I don't want to ever put myself through that again. It's not worth it. I think, yeah, I would agree. I mean, network TV, uh, even under the best of circumstances, there is just the nature of the beast. They, there is so much anxiety and panic in network television because it's, th th look, nobody knows, nobody, you don't know what's gonna work. Nobody knows, we don't know. And so uh, on a lot of the like cable and streaming channels, at least there's a greater freedom to let the creative people fail on their own terms. So, right. Which is all you can ask. Just It may not work, but at least let us fail on our own terms, as opposed to on network TV, there are too many people who are earning a salary to have opinions about something that is magical and ephemeral and nobody knows. And so that's when you get buried with notes and you are a, you're a victim of everyone's panic. And I think that, more than anything, is the thing we wouldn't want to go back to. Do you remember um, some sort of choice notes that you have received in the past uh, about projects or about episodes? Uh, this is, uh, believe it or not, we got a note from the BBC. Oh, yeah. Right? You, you, they're the BBC, they're supposed to be like hands off. Yeah, and smart. I mean, so we're living there, we're going, and, and her note was, does it have to rain all the time? <laughs> and we said, <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, no, it does not. It, it does. It rains all the time. It's not. We didn't make that up. This is what it's like here. That yeah. although, yeah. how and great are you doing at everything? If they're like, I feel the weather is a oh, little. Oh no, no, no. Much. We we have to. Yeah, no. The, I, right. the great irony was we our first set of notes from the BBC were worse than, worse than any, any American notes we'd notes. gotten from America. We were like, hold it, you're the BBC. What was the other thing that she oh. said? Sean the character's Beverly. name is Sean. I, that doesn't sound like a British name. I thought, it's named after a couple, a British couple that we knew named Sean and Beverly. So how is it? And she said, you should try to find a more British-y sounding. And the compromise was, she said, well, maybe, we were spelling it S-H-A-W-N. And she said, well, maybe if you change the spelling to S-E-A-N. Oh, OK. <laughs> We're like, the spell it? No, it's not a book. No one's ever, fine, fine. This is, and they weren't paying us enough for these notes. No. No, 
It's true. Um, but it's yeah, true. no, that but was we've, the note. Yeah. Uh, oh my God. Uh, but we've gotten some over the years, some really horrendous network notes. I mean, just shocking. And they're usually wrong. I mean, stuff that I love, bits that we do that I think this is the best part of the scene, that will be the note. Does he have to dawdle before he walks out the door? And it's like, yeah, he has, yeah, that's funny. That's the funny thing when he's kind of, but no. And so, I mean, when you get, so let's you're working on, you're working in network TV, you're working on the class, whatever it is, and you get a note like that. Do you fight? I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, yeah, and the answer is, yeah. I, I, and I would say I do, too. And it, if it's something that is really stupid, I mean, when it's something like change the spelling of Sean's name, yeah. fine, fine. Right. You could, we're, you're talking to yourself, fine. But if it's something like, this, going back to the class, in the pilot of the class, there's a scene toward the very, very end where Jesse Tyler Ferguson's character has met this, we, when we meet the character, he's about to kill himself, and, and then he gets invited to a party, so he decides to wait. Um, and so at the end, and he meets a girl at the party, and it's lovely, and he has finally, for the first time, he has this, a moment of happiness, and they oh, go right. out for a cup of coffee, yes. and they part, and he calls her immediately just to say how much he loved that cup of coffee. And what he's unaware of is as he backs out, he runs her over. <gasps> and it's funny. <laughs> I swear to God, it's funny. And it's shocking. And it's funny. And she's OK. And it gives you the, uh, much of the rest of the season is repairing she's that. And she's in a cast in a wheelchair. And, and it's great. And it's shockingly like laugh out loud funny. And of course, and it's the, our favorite thing in the pilot. And the network note was, does he have to run her over? And it's like, yeah, the whole show has built. <laughs> but that's, that's and we it's... dug on our heels and we went, yes, and if it's not funny, we'll cut it, but you have to let us shoot it, because that's your show. Right. That's your show, and so, yes. And you, a- you... Occasionally, because you have some background in doing this, they say, okay, you're right. No, I don't think it has anything to do with that. You, yeah, I agree. You would think it you would. Wouldn't. You would hope. But it, right. it doesn't. The day after Friends wrapped, I'll never forget this, we were packing up our stuff, and as we walked past David's parking space, they were painting, <laughs> painting over his name. It was the next morning. <laughs> and I just thought, okay, this, is, this says it all. This is it, you yeah. know? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I understand even more how you got the idea to yeah. write episodes. We, we actually right? did that in episodes. Yeah. Merck gets fired, and as he's pulling out, they're like going over his name on the... And that's, that's, that's what it's like. That's network television. Yeah, you, 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 you build... You think you've built up collateral, and actually... No. no. It, it evaporates incredibly quickly. So now, so you're, you're going to end the season. Seven episodes is the final product. I, you, I mean, I can ask you for a tease, but would you prefer not to? I don't know. What, what would you say? It's, uh... I, I mean, uh, uh, we, did, we did decide to put a bow on it. We do, okay. because we, um, we, we've seen a lot of shows where it, there's a kind of, um, you know, an ending that's not really an ending. And we thought, you know what? No, this, this show wants a satisfying conclusion. So... Hopefully, it is that. Um, but beyond that, it's just taking the relationships to their, hopefully, their happy, organic conclusion. Natural closure. Hopefully. You, you've uh, obviously, you know, they call this the golden age of television. And a lot of comedies, I mean, people are always debating, is this a comedy? Is this a drama? Because comedy is pretty dark. You know, when Edie Falco won an Emmy for Nurse Jackie in comedy, she was like, it's a drama. You know, Transparent is a comedy. Everyone's like, is it a comedy? I cry half the time. Mm -hmm. So where do you see, as far as writing, um, the comedic sensibility going from where we are right now? I feel like we're old fashioned. I always think if it's a comedy, it should be funny and you should laugh. And we'll watch, a lot of the shows we watch and we like aren't funny. And they're, co- you watch Girls ever? Mm-hmm. I mean, Girls isn't funny. I mean, it's good, but it's not funny. 
and, and so many shows, like if they're 30 minutes, it's a comedy. And it's like, really? That's all it takes? Yeah, we, we actually we have a line in this new season where one of the characters says to Sean and Beverly, you're, you're so old school. That's the new, that's the new funny. Then a comedy, 30 minutes and you're a comedy. It doesn't matter what happens in it. <laughs> it's just a time constraint. It, it does not have to be fun, but it feels that way. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, and this is just my statement, one of the things I love about episodes, even though it is satire and it can be very biting, I feel everything that I've enjoyed of what you guys have written does have heart behind it, which is, um, it is different. I feel like it is different than a lot of stuff, and maybe that is old-fashioned. We, I don't know. We won't sacrifice character for, for a laugh. I'd rather not have a laugh at, at that moment and, and have some truth there, you know? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And, the, and the, in terms of what the episodes are about, it is, it, it's, it's important to us that you care about something and you're invested and, and at the same time, yeah, we're, we feel a responsibility at the same time to also be funny. And because we have that feeling when we watch a half hour show that isn't, didn't have a smile in it. And we're just like, I don't know, we have dramas for that. Right, and life. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, we'd like to open it up, actually, to some Q&A from people in the audience, uh, and we'll do that right now with the first person sitting right in the very front here. Just, if you wouldn't mind, uh, uh, no microphone, just yell it out. Okay. Yell it out. Um, so, I love the fact that you write together, and when you're done watching The View in the morning and you guys decide that you have to write together, how does that happen? Do you have different things that you've talked about or different goals? I can just paraphrase. So it's basically the process, like when you get up in the morning, you're done watching The View, how, what is the process of going like, all right, we're gonna sit down. Well, first I'll talk about Whoopi a little bit. I'll say, she's just sat there, she didn't say anything. She's just like, I could do that. Uh, and then David will, will try to focus me a little bit. And, and we'll have a specific uh, scene that we're working on. Yeah, I, I would say probably of the two of us, I'm, we were saying this before, I'm more organizational. I'm, uh, he I'm, types. I do all the typing. I, I'm the one who, uh, Jeffrey likes to pace. I pace. He'll pace around and uh, I tend to be, and it's not a, just the one who goes, okay, this is what we're working on. And, and I forget what, what it's called, left side, right side of the brain, but you're much more just, and you're the one who'll come in with just, I woke up with an idea. And I'm more of a plotter. Uh, I'll, I'll, while he's watching The View, I'll like go on a hike or something, just trying to think about the scene so that when, when and you'll just like, and I'll have like thought about this and this, and Jeffrey will go, what about this? And it'll be like, sure. Let's, it'll be so much better than the thing that I spent those last but, three but it's hours. Not, it's, it's just, it, I don't know how that happens. I swear to you. It does, I, you know, and then I just like, channel them, I channel the characters. And then there's a certain point where uh, in the process of just, there's that's the writing, and then a, a, a lot of time is spent rewriting. That we'll, we'll have a draft, we'll each do notes on the draft, we'll go through it again. And so uh, the thing we we're talking about where because we shoot the entire season at one run, we have to be, we can't make mistakes. We have to go to that table read because we, we have the table read and then two days later we start shooting and because it's just the two of us, if, and we're shooting out of order, thank God we didn't have any major story problems. Because I think if we ever heard an episode and we had to throw out like the second half of something, we would really be in trouble. So that's why we do so much prep. We do so many drafts of every episode so that when we arrive at that table read, we're just beating jokes. We're also we're a stickler, as you can say, uh, tell them, uh, uh, for getting the words right. I mean, we, we write in all the ums and the pauses and the, uh, right? I think you'd like to do other things. <laughs> <laughs> so if one of your actor does a little improv, do you go, ah, no, 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 no. We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't do, do any improv. improv. <laughs> no, we don't. And, and I'm, there are people who are really good at it. And we don't, but we don't, 
we're not comfortable with it, so we don't ever no. go there. Yeah. I wish we could, because I think you, sometimes you can improve on the script. Yeah. But Do you I think wish you could more? No. You don't? <laughs> You're not just saying that? <laughs> and then I'll turn to Dave and I'll say, we'll cut it and post. It's fine, it's fine. Yes, sir. First of all, I want to say that after I saw that Mad About You episode with the toilet paper, <laughs> I had a roommate who did the same thing and I asked, I counted him and I asked that out. He was very plainly said, I want to. <laughs> uh, the six actors that we all know as friends, were they the original choices or might have they been a different configuration at some point? That we... uh, it, was, it was a long casting process. And uh, I, I mean, I will say without being specific, in the course of it, we made some offers to actors who turned us down. Um, thank God. Because we ended up with the absolute right six, obviously. Um, but you don't know as you're going on that journey. But tell about the, the letter you got from that actor towards the oh, end. There, there was an actor who uh, the network was really keen on. NBC just loved. And so um, they, they wanted to put him in everything, everything. And so we could not find Chandler. We knew about Matthew Perry, but uh, he already had another pilot, so we weren't allowed to go to him. Uh, and so eventually we couldn't find Chandler, so the network kept pushing, so we offered it to this other actor. Meanwhile, so he, and he turned us down, and he turned down the Noah Wiley part on ER that season in order to do a show that he would star in that wasn't an ensemble. Which lasted six episodes. And, and two years later, he wrote a very sweet letter to us saying... It, I, it was also a suicide note, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Which was... <laughs> yeah. And he did acknowledge, and he goes, you know, thank God for your show, because I, I couldn't have done as good a job as Matthew. But yeah, so casting... Do you think he believed that, really? <laughs> Casting, yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe, yeah. yeah. I think yeah, casting's casting's really hard, and you, you know, you you go through it, and you don't know if you're going to find the right people. And uh, Lisa Kudrow was fired off of Frasier; she was going to be Roz, I think. Yeah. And they fired her the first day, and she was devastated. And the truth of the matter, it, had she not. Although, I guess, Frasier's not chopped liver either. But she would not have gotten to do Phoebe. Yeah. So yeah. it's, it's, it's all timing. And, it's... and we, uh, we had another actress as Beverly. Um, oh, God. We cast another actress as Beverly. And we knew she wasn't right, but we couldn't find the right one. And, and she was just different. And it was at the table read mm. for the first season. And it just, and all we'd heard her do was one scene. Because yeah. that's what you, you know, you, when you have an audition, you don't have the chance to hear. So it's, so she, we're at the table where we're now reading seven episodes. And by the second episode, Jeffrey and I are passing notes to each other going, oh no, oh no, 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 no. Um, and uh, the network at the end of it insisted that we replace her. And uh, we just thought, oh, we're screwed. We're Shows really over. screwed. So we decided to go out. That was one of the few nights we ever went out. <laughs> we, and we went to the theater and we saw a play. And the star of the play was Tamsin Gregg. And she was playing an American, ironically. Yeah. And I said, God, she looks exactly... Because we always pictured Beverly as a uh, Emma Thompson type, you know, kind of... And out walks this actress and I thought... That's her, she's great. Why didn't we see her? And they said, well, because she was in this play. And you went with this other actress. And at, at the last minute, the play was canceled, it turns out, and she's now available. And she came in that next morning at eight o'clock, she came to our hotel yeah. and read, and it was like, oh. It was absolutely an epiphany. It was just where you go, oh, there you go, there's the character. We have not heard it yet, and finally we've heard it. And by the end of the day, she was in it, and we were shooting three days later. Yeah. But it's, it's really, I always say it's Cinderella's slipper, you know, unless you, you, you can 
try to stuff the foot in there. But, but, but it's true. Only one, there's it's only one person that really is the exact. We're back to shoes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, go right ahead. We like Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley really makes and us yeah. laugh. Crashing? Is that on Crash. HBO? Yeah, on HBO. On HBO? Uh, was, uh, yeah. Oh, and People, from, People of Earth? Have you seen that on where is TBS. It? It's funny. Really uh, funny. Yeah. Um, we don't watch a lot of comedies. Which is, we, and maybe because it's, we, we, we watch some, but not a lot. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I, really those few. Are, are there any shows, uh, you know, any time that you have watched that you were like, that is the show I want to write. Like, it's already done, it's already written. No, it's, it's usually, I couldn't write that show. <laughs> you know? Right. Seriously, I, most of the stuff we see, I think, God, I don't know how they do it. I couldn't, I couldn't come up with that. I couldn't write those characters. I, I, I'm, I'm always very impressed by other people's work. Right, it's just marvel yeah. what they, what how they do. How do they yeah. do that? And then they do that to your work as well. <laughs> uh, we have time for one more question, if someone has one. Yes, sir, right in the middle. What's your revision process like? And when do you know you're done? When do you know you're done? I don't think we ever feel like we're done. I mean, we'll watch a cut and we'll go... We'll still watch Friends episodes and go, we could have beat that yeah, joke. Yeah, 10 more minutes. We couldn't have stayed 10 more minutes to come up with a better joke. So, uh, it, But it's true. It, it, yeah. There's never a sense of, God, yeah, was... it's Someone once described it as pencils down television. That it's just, you're doing it until pencils down. Pens, you're, you're, either you're shooting it and pencils down. And, but even in post, especially on episodes, because... We post is just the two of us at again home. at home. We, we move edit some editing at equipment into the house and we do it there with an editor. And uh, so I even then, which is <laughs> right. we 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 even then in post, sometimes there's a scene that isn't working, and we'll come up with a solution whereby, well, well if we what if we play this that moment on her back and we can give him an off-screen line so, and, and you're still tweaking to try to make it work. Yeah, so we never stop, mm -mm. which is until it's Until the show's locked yeah. and then pencils down. And then we can just hate it for eternity. <laughs> <laughs> it's that positive we watched, attitude Actually, we flew out with Chris and, and Kathleen and, and they wanted to see the first couple of episodes and so we put it on, uh, on the plane and they were watching it. And the whole time, we're just staring at Chris and Kathleen. I'm thinking, mm -hmm. why isn't he laughing? Yeah. <laughs> we shouldn't have gone with that one. We what? shouldn't have gone with that one. He's, yeah, he's yeah. now, I no. can't believe it. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I thought you. that was funny. Well, it's, apparently it's not funny, yeah. <laughs> There's so much insecurity up here, it's stupid. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that, is, uh, that is the end of our In the Shoes. Thank you so much, Jeffrey Cleric, David Crane. We look forward to the final season. Thank you so much for coming this afternoon, everybody.